Welcome back to the Pursuit Podcast. Today, we're going to be taking a look at tech communities, how to build them, how to scale them, and how to grow them in a healthy way. Before we get started, a quick thank you to our sponsor. Nexamo provides developers with APIs that let you seamlessly integrate voice, SMS, authentication, and a whole host of other really interesting features into your projects. You can find out more about their products at nexamo.com. But if you wanted to get on Twitter and thank them for sponsoring the podcast, you can find them on at Nexamo Dev. I'm your host, Jessica Rose, and today we're going to be talking to Ben Halpern, founder of Dev2. Dev2. Can you tell me a little bit about the Dev2 community? Uh, yeah. Well, the first thing is that it's pronounced Dev2 and not uh, Dev2 or Dev.2. We're just trying to really uh, nail that down because it's confusing. But basically, it's a project that started a couple of years ago just as my Twitter account, The Practical Dev. And I did a lot of editorial on software development, a lot of discussion and sort of started leading into a feeling where I really wanted it to be a little bit more about community, goal-oriented, really wanting to change software development for the better. And then it that's where it really became a true community platform. So let's go back a little bit. You talked about how this came out of a Twitter exchange or a Twitter handle? A Twitter handle. Uh, I started a Twitter account called The Practical Dev. And going back to the origins, I really feel like I just wanted to create an account where I could share practical advice or thoughts about programming, as well as sort of inject my thoughts and humor or any sort of thing I felt like adding to the dialogue. And it really grew wonderfully from there. I know everybody cringes when I say these two words, but almost like thought leadership without the hype or the hot takes. Yeah, I think that's a pretty good description of the whole thing. Like, it falls into the thought leadership bubble, except from a tone, I would have to say, very much anti-thought leadership. (laughs) The anti-thought leader. I'll go ahead and I'll plaster that on a billboard for you. So you were you were using this Twitter handle and you were sort of growing it. You got a decent audience off of it. What made you stop and say, oh, wow, I've got something that needs to move or needs to change or needs to evolve into sort of a more more community-shaped community. Yeah, so originally it was like my persona, like an alternate developer persona, which was really liberating and in a way like I just kind of got to play a character in a sense, but really sort of talk about and address a lot of developer issues. But along the way, I knew I didn't want to just be sort of one rambling voice for the rest of my life. I really preferred, one, building things and scaling things, being a software developer, And two, I really didn't think that my voice alone was necessarily the most important thing long term. I knew I was building a pretty compassionate community of followers based on what we were kind of talking about. And I really wanted to be more about amplifying people as opposed to just kind of controlling the conversation myself. And really, it was a few conversations that really made me realize some of the initial community efforts were really some of the things people that change people's lives the most, like any opportunity to really amplify someone's story or really sort of connect them with other developers. As much as people really, really grew attached to the editorial takes, the persona, I knew the impact that was being made through the other initiatives and how much I really cared about some of the other stuff we were doing really made me want to sort of focus all in on building the community I thought that developers didn't have and really needed. So yeah, almost a digital platform to share the stage. Can you tell me a little bit or tell us a little bit or even tell our dear listener a little bit about what your first steps were? Did you immediately go, oh, it's a portal on the web? Or was there sort of a process to get there? Yeah, it was a real process. I recall like some advice I just randomly came across when I was 19 that's really stuck with me in terms of entrepreneurship, which I've sort of been doing in some capacity for like most of my life, which was kind of someone just like randomly and some random thought leader at the time uh, (laughs) talked about how like sometimes in order to get to your big vision, you kind of should start with more or less a bit of a copy of what other people are doing or like a less creative first vision. And then sort of build from there because you can't really build anything all that remarkable in a great sense if you're just going to immediately start building like the thing that already requires it to be big. And a community by its nature needs everyone to be there already before you can really make some of the special things happen. So it was really like every step of the way was building the thing that 
was most useful to the number of people currently using it. So it really started, I would write, I would invite a few like other people to write, but it didn't matter that it didn't really need that kind of network effect at first, but now it's really driven by that. So it sounds like building a series of MVPs, but like minimum for the folks who are there now and stretching it as more folks get along? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And really trying to, from a design perspective, give people the right idea as to what the current thing they were supposed to be doing was, and not necessarily what I thought the long-term vision was. And that really has been the goal ever since. Never try to like push people to be acting or playing or with the product or doing community stuff that's not obviously the right thing to be doing at the time. We really let kind of things evolve naturally, but with a with a with an ideology that we can pretty easily stick to in the long run. Okay. So let's say hypothetically that I, or that hypothetically our dear listener, really wants to build an online community. Let's sort of walk through step by step. And what kinds of decisions would they or would I need to make first? My first major decision was to stick with this for a long time, no matter how long it took. Okay. So it's like buckle down and get determined. Well, like not even just determined. Like I, I, I didn't like go hard every day on this. I just gave myself a long time span for success so that if I had hiccups or I needed to like go back to the drawing board on anything, I knew I had the freedom and I wasn't rushed and I could really focus on the nuance. So that was really day one. I, I told myself that I had 10 years to make this thing successful in any capacity And it really took a lot of pressure off of me and let me sort of build the long-term thing. I really didn't think I needed a huge community on day one. I really just thought if I truly believed in this and I was convinced that I wouldn't not believe in this in 10 years, I could sort of take the time to get it right. So that was was a really big initial insight. I, I looked back at some old projects that I'd done in this space and realized the biggest issue was kind of just not believing that the initial traction was enough and kind of giving up on the project. Because these things really can take some time and you need to learn from your own efforts, not necessarily external stuff. I love how the, the sort of overarching principles and the, the best advice you're able to give on building online and on building a tech community kind of sounds a little bit like stuff we get told when we're little. Like, well, you know, you've got to be really patient and you can't make the other kids do what you want. They're their own people. It sounds very much like playground rules for building online communities. Oh, yeah. I don't know. I feel like the advice I got when I was little is the same advice I'd give to any adult and, you know, communities when you're little. or It's just like life lessons, which if anything get lost when you're an adult, there's such a go, go, like fail fast movement and, you know, all this stuff. And I knew that if I really focused on the principle of the whole thing, everything else would work itself out as long as I gave myself enough time and uh, truly like convince myself that it was worth doing in the long run. There's more to it than that, I think. We can kind of get into any other sort of details along the way, but in terms of what it took, any key insights that really made this thing work from the start, that was definitely the big one. Let's get into some of those details. Let's talk about maybe wrangling humans. If I'm building an online community for the first time, I'm creating spaces for people to exchange ideas, to communicate. Are there any sort of ground rules or any sort of best best practices where it's like, hey, do this on day one, Otherwise, it's going to buy you a lot of trouble later down the line. Or do this day one, it'll make your life really easy. I mean, in in terms of strategies for growth, thinking about how certain people's time isn't quite as scarce as you really think it is. So really being able to break down some mental barriers in terms of who you can email and sort of ask for a small favor that's co-beneficial. So on day one, when I made this website, I didn't even have the website built yet. But I had an idea based on some other sort of interactions I've had in my life that if you send someone an email, they might just say yes to what you're asking for if it's easy for them to do. So before I even launched the the site, I knew Rails 5 was going to be launching soon in just the technology I was following. I emailed uh, DHH, asked him to answer a few questions as a little interview, and he said yes, and he just answered these kind of quick questions. It was a quick interview that nobody else was really giving him, like nobody really cared about Rails from a journalistic perspective. But I knew that if I did that, he would share it, the greater community would get another perspective on like what to expect in this technology launch. 
And that was just day one. We got the first post that went up on the site, got eight or 10,000 reads or something. And it didn't take any community. It just took a little bit of thought about he's a big deal in some sense, but he's also like a human who's not getting a million press requests every day. Like when it comes down to it, he just answered the email and said yes. And I had a few other yeses like that early on. And that's kind of where I went. And these days we don't even do that because we really evolved to be a platform or sort of people share their own stuff. But we always sort of go back to these ideas of people are actually a little more generous with their time as long as you make it easy for them. So ask for help, but ask for these little self-contained time boxed bits of help. Yeah, make it really, really easy for people to say yes. And then don't ask for any more of their time than that. Like, genuinely do stuff that isn't annoying in any sense. I just thought about like my own, anytime I've been asked to do something simple myself, that's actually really a compliment. Like sort of when you asked me to be on this podcast, it was really easy for me to say yes, because I was excited to share and talk. And it's a really great step one. And I don't think people go into all the details about your listenership or like anything like that. You know, if it's, if it's a friendly, easy, yes, people say yes. And as a way to kind of kickstart ventures like this, we're not building a community, but we're kind of spreading the word a little bit. And it's little things like this, which help. Yeah. And if I have any advice for like asking people to do small things for the podcast, I've found that trying to bribe people with hologram stickers really helps. I kind of assume that's what got you on board. (laughs) Well, yeah, I mean, it's amazing how much people don't actually think through the economics of an exchange they're making. Like some engineers sometimes get too caught up in the value exchange proposition that's actually going on and how much is someone's time worth? What's an hour worth as an engineer? But really, uh, people really like sparkly stickers and and just being asked questions and being asked to talk and share. And that's so much what developer communities are in the short term and in the long run, no matter what, is playing to people's humanity as much as possible. It's a fantastic way to frame it and a fantastic way to look at not just tech, but sort of human interactions and the transactional nature of being complimentary, open and kind. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, there's a lot of real, tangible, amazing things that can happen just by giving someone a compliment and then letting them talk about what their expertise is, making them feel just kind of happy to share and talk. And that really gets into a lot of just what the community building component's been like from day one as well. Really sort of thinking to the humanity a major reason we got off Twitter in the first place, like it's easy that you can kind of build these communities on right on Twitter in a sense, but we had really no capacity to manage the conversation, to actually moderate things. So I was going to ask about moderation. Yeah. Uh, moderation is really hard and I don't think we have all the answers, but skeptics kind of think it's impossible at a certain scale. And, you know, they look at Twitter and see how terrible things are sometimes there in other communities and just it's in the news every day. It's a real sort of issue in society. And I I see this as like someone who's been in this space ever since the start of my tech career in one way or another. I've always been interested in this sort of stuff, um, both as a human and as a technologist. And I look at some of these communities and I genuinely see places where they reached 5 million, 10 million active users before they even thought of moderation or as anti-harassment techniques or anything like that was even a problem. And from day one, we thought of that as like our core differentiator for the developer community. We were going to be active participants in fostering constructive conversations, making people feel like they're not being attacked, uh, making people feel like their input is welcome, teaching the community to teach itself, like really promoting leaders who do a good job with this. And it absolutely scales. I mean, and we also like, we don't let things scale kind of out of control. We really take a concerted effort consistently to try to make this stuff work. And yeah, I was actually going to touch on that because I was planning on stealing from you nicely. If you go to dev.to, not devto, not dev.to, but dev2, and scroll all the way... Dev2, to, yeah. Dev2, dev2, very on brand, my apologies. If you go to <laughs> dev2, never dev.to, and you scroll all the way to the bottom, we've got a lot of really interesting information. You've got an about page, which I love because it sort of gives some information on about folks. I'm going to come back to the sustaining membership in a moment, but you've got the privacy policy, the terms of use right here, and also a very, what looks like a very carefully considered code of conduct, which has been adapted for your specific community. 
Yeah, and we never want anyone to feel like they're being policed. We do a lot of nudging. We give people adequate warning, but we don't tap dance around the issue if people are acting in a harassing way. We, we have a lot of internal conversations consistently about how to enforce the certain behavior. We keep track of use cases consistently. So like if our team isn't sure about how to do things, it's kind of like a common law evolution where we determine how we treated other people. And then the technology itself, like we enforce uh, social logins from existing platforms that you're a part of. So we actually uh, cut down on harassment and spam right from the beginning, just on the technical side. So like if you have a brand new Twitter account, you automatically are going to sort of be watched, you know, by our system. So like if you make your first comment, you're more likely to just get a moderator to give it the A-OK. We don't really gatekeep in terms of like who can contribute right away because that can be kind of anti-productive. But we really have a whole moderation system that's sort of like a monitor. Like we just try to really make that our core competency. I think we spend more time on that than a lot of other components of the site. So I do want to bounce back a bit because we've had a really nice look at how you got started, sort of the history of this. Uh, It's not just you on the team, I don't think. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I started the project, but I brought in Jess Lee fairly early on. It already had some legs, but I met her in the context of she wanted a software development mentor. I randomly knew her through a friend I knew from summer camp in Canada, and she went to college with in upstate New York. And she wanted software development mentorship, and I was happy to provide that. But then we sort of like, she had an interesting background in the rest of her career. I thought she was a very, very disciplined, hardworking individual and was an awesome person to bring onto the team. And then she compliments me so well. And you should have her on the podcast too, if you ever want to do a I should future. Do. I've uh, got a, a big bias towards Jess's. I, I do love getting the occasional <laughs> email from the service where it's like, Jess says hi, where it's like, oh, okay, yeah, hey, hey. Oh yeah, you should definitely we'll bully her on reasonably soon. Yeah, you should. You should. We we'll just have like a Jess panel show. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. She should be on every. And Jess is like, a, she's a little bit more nervous about public speaking and stuff than I am. But she'll, uh, I'll, def- I'll pressure her into doing it for sure. And I'm such a bully. We'll make this happen. If, if they want, yeah, if Great. she wants to, and if it's okay. And then there's one more person, Peter, who I was actually doing a different startup with for a few years. Uh, It was a whole different relationship. I was hired on to be the technical co-founder in another startup with him when I first moved to New York. And it was, and we developed a pretty good relationship, but our other company um, really had some momentum for a few years, but then really just did not look like it was going to return for the investors and just the economics of the situation really made it seem like the Dev2 and everything we were doing with the practical dev really seemed like this could actually be an opportunity to make a a real dent in the coding universe. And so I had been working with him and that was the real inflection point where I had to really turn this over and make it a real thing because Jess and I were actually very much struggling to like maintain our sanity while also doing other jobs and doing this on the side and being fair to everyone. And so Peter's brought a lot to the team just in terms of his other perspective. He's very different from Jess and I. You briefly touched on something I'd love to explore more because you talked a bit about sustainability for the team. And a lot of times when we hear people talk about building or growing communities, they talk about the sustainability of the communities or the platform or the tech. And you very rarely hear people talk about almost sort of maintainer fatigue, but for communities and community management. Oh yeah, uh, absolutely. We we were running it as a side project on another business and everything like that. And it, it just, for the sake of the community and the sake of ourselves, it just wasn't the ideal scenario. We really needed to take our whole professional circles, the people I was working with. Jess was working at DoSomething.org, a really great nonprofit. We sort of liked every individual thing, but we were doing way too many different things. And so DevTube is a company, it's also a community, but we this was really the opportunity to be like, well, we can actually pay our bills a little bit by doing this full time at this point, And we'd be doing ourselves and the overall community a real disservice if we didn't really lean into this at this point. You also mentioned paying the bills. And I think that's something really interesting. In a perfect world, if our dear listeners starting a new online community, they don't want to be paying for it out of pocket too much. You all have a membership structure. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? Yeah, so we sort of paid the bills, but a few ways, nothing we would consider like our definite forever way we we monetize this thing. But in order to make it all work, we have a membership structure where people are allowed to 
just kind of join on and get a few different perks through a sustaining membership where they're allowed to just pay whatever they want. And that was just kind of like if we were going to let the real hardcore fans of the community really just give back without an obvious return, that was the kind of clear first way to do it. And we've experimented with what we can really offer there. And in the long run, we really do want to grow some of the membership perks or some of the feature sets to be a more clearly defined, of course, I would pay such and such a month just to be a part of it. But We also have some really great community corporate sponsors who we reach out to every month. And we didn't get into this so we could just be about sponsorships and about this and that. So we have some other initiatives in the works. But mostly everything has taken a backseat to growing the community and making sure that everyone knows they share our values, that we're here for the long run. We're really interested in growing this to be a really special part of the overall developer community. So I think that's interesting to address where like if somebody's looking to build a new online community and they're looking to just get started, it's probably not going to make them millions of dollars tomorrow. No, I mean, we have, I talk to people with much smaller things going on who make much more money than we do. Like, but we, we've been growing, no, we, we make all the money we need in the world right now. Like, as I mentioned, we had a previous startup and we still had some of that money. And instead of letting that go to zero, we just told our investors, we just let them kind of get a good deal. So we had a bit of seed capital just to kind of keep things going. And we have a great business. We don't like, uh, I think we could be making all that money that everybody else is making with their different startups, but we, uh, We make enough to pay our staff right now, but we are consistently growing like wildfire with the overall community. So I was trying to keep our dear listeners like hopes realistic, but you're like, no, no, you can make all the money you need if you work really hard and if you're lucky. Yeah. It's incredibly difficult. And we like didn't really have high hopes early on for any, the monetization in this kind of business is the hardest things, much smaller things that are just in a totally different kind of space in the developer landscape have a much easier time finding the money and doing the stuff. And that's why like, it was a 10 year thing. Like I didn't think we could do this quickly. I didn't think you can kind of put up a shop and start asking people for money right away. And we also don't want to like alienate people or do anything that we're not proud of. And that's kind of why we haven't blown the lid off of the sponsorship stuff. We can be making a lot of money putting ads everywhere, but it's not what we want to do. And we have much more creative, co-beneficial ways we think we'll be able to make money in the long run. And, and overall, we're kind of more scale and growth junkies and really like interested in how this is really changing the developer community more so than hyper focus on some of the business components. It sounds like it's a a sort of lifestyle business in the most literal sense. It's a community that you've all built because you wanted this very specific community to exist. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I'm not saying we'll never make a ton of money with this in that sort of sense where you call something a lifestyle business. But this was a project I thought had to happen one way or another. Someone had to do it. I just wasn't satisfied with some of the other efforts out there. And not that there aren't a ton of really great efforts. I just didn't think the really huge big ones were addressing the humanity of software development as a first class citizen. Wow. Can you say that again? That was marvelous. (laughs) The humanity of the software developer as a first class citizen. I'd love to unpack this a little bit. Yeah, I mean, we're people that write code, and I really think the only way things sustainably happen are when we focus on the humanity. And, you know, code is about communication, about consistency of effort. If you're arguing and burning out and being antisocial, you're giving like 10% of your potential effort. And we really want to unlock 100% of the software community's efforts There's just so much, so much wasted time on pedantic issues. And it's not how we ideally want to do our own software development. And as much as we can, we want to nudge the whole community to be more collaborative, accepting and driven to be good to each other. That's fantastic. Sort of asking software developers, maybe more inviting software developers and inviting technologists to share as complete and entire healthy human beings is maybe a little more radical than I might have expected to hear from growing tech communities. It's a big goal, but incredibly exciting one. Yeah. And I think the community knows this is not stuff I definitely like say explicitly a lot or really anybody goes around hammering the drum on. But I think the community really gets a sense of where we stand based on how we address things or based on what we care about. And so much of what we're saying, you know, is 
certainly reflected in our ideology and but it's also another step to actually reflect that in a technology product in the interface and stuff like that and i think we're still i think a long way away from like really reflecting our best selves in our technology but that's just because programming is hard and it's hard to get all the interfaces right it's hard to get all the the cues and the buttons and everything to like really be what you want it to be but we've been very transparent and public and gotten people to buy into the way we think about things. And it's been really fun to have so many people get behind it. This is fantastic. A community of technical humans building technical human experiences for technical humans. (laughs) Yeah. And the the closest thing we've come out to an actual tagline is it's the human layer of the stack. But I don't know, as mentioned with the fact that we didn't do a good job early on of telling people how the whole thing is even pronounced and the fact that it started as the practical dev, but then it became dev two and it's still the practical dev on Twitter. And so I can't say we're the best at like taglines and naming things. And, and I hear naming things is hard though. Yeah. People have always had a much better idea of our ideology than our name or how our interface works or anything like that, but it's all kind of working itself out over time. This has been a fantastic look at the experience that you and the team have had growing this community, but I think there's really valuable lessons for folks growing communities on or offline anywhere, based around technology or not. Oh, yeah. If folks wanted to find out more about the community online, where could they find it? Hmm. So if you go to Dev2 and you search the word Dev2, I think a lot of the meta posts do a good job of talking about what we're about. But ultimately, uh, we're a sort of a professional networking platform similar to others. You can kind of expect the same kind of interactions you might on LinkedIn or Twitter or anywhere else you reach your fellow developers. We're coming up on 100,000 registered users and we reach about... uh, Whoa! Yeah, and we reach... uh, I mean, yes. (laughs) And we also, that's actually like not even really uh, reflective of the scope of everything because, you know, everything posted on the platform really gets diffused into the ecosystem because it's all publicly available. There's no registration walls for, for any of the conversations. So because of the diffusion of knowledge, how we share it on Twitter and Google and everything like that, we reach about 1.5 million uniques a month. And it's really been growing, like really grown like wildfire lately. And people are having a harder and harder time avoiding it in their day-to-day sometimes depending on where you find your programming knowledge base sort of stuff like uh you might find a dev2 article the same way you might stumble across uh, a stack overflow post or anything else these days so the way we're really encouraging the community not only to be good to one another but to actually use that as momentum to contribute to the actual technical ways people write code which is finding stuff on the internet that answers their questions fantastic Yeah, it's all been part of the journey. Uh, So if folks want to check it out for themselves, it's Dev2. And I'm going to spell it so I don't accidentally misbrand you, which is D-E-V dot T-O. If they wanted to find you on the internet to hear more of your words of wisdom or see more of the cool stuff you're doing, where do you live online? Yeah, I'm uh, Ben D. Halpern is, is my Twitter handle. My GitHub is Ben Halpern without the D. And, you know, if you search Ben Halpern, uh, I'm the second one to come up behind a, uh, a marine biologist who really owns the Google results. <laughs> I mean, marine biology is pretty cool. And uh, actually, if you really want to find out about me, go to dev 2 Ben. I really make use of the platform heavily to take part in the developer community and stuff like that. So that's kind of where you'll uh, find me puttering around most of the time. Fantastic. Ben, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I can't wait to hear this. Uh, And thank you, dear listener, for listening. If you want to check out the illustrated sketch notes from this episode, find us on Twitter at at PursuitPod. Otherwise, if you just want to listen, come on back for the next episode. We'll have something brand new. I've been your host, Jessica Rose, and thank you so much for joining us.